first and last verse. Uh, several of us are fresh off the trip from the dying of singing, uh, so I just I ex I expect when I when I when I start leading any song in this book, four thousand strong, just to belt it. So uh, we had a good time. Seven hundred eighty-eight. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Be number 44. <clears throat> so four, four. <clears throat> four, four. Sing the first and last verse, and then we will have our scripture reading and we'll stand for the opening prayer. Earthly wealth and fame may never come to me, and the palace fair in mine may never be, but let come what may, if Christ for me doth care.
along, I'll be reading 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. That's 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10. In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let's all stand for opening prayer. Let's bow our heads and pray, please. Our most kind, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for another morning to come together and worship you. Dear Lord, we just ask you to please be with us all during this worship service, to help us all focus, have our minds concentrated on worshiping you, dear Lord. Dear Lord, we just ask you to please be with the teachers and the lessons we're going here this morning. Just help them all have a ready remembrance of what they've studied. Dear Lord, we just thank you for the good report that Sister Jackie had on her sister. We thank you for all the many blessings that you've given us. Dear Lord, we just ask you to please be with everyone that is on the sick list and comfort them and their families. Dear Heavenly Father, at this time we'd ask you to please be with this church, please be with the leaders of it. Help us always to do thy will. Dear Heavenly Father, we just ask you to just please be with us during the rest of this service. Christ, we pray. Amen. Remain standing if you don't mind as we prepare our minds to partake of the Lord's Supper on this first day of the week. Let's sing number 440. Four, four, zero. Sing all three verses. My Jesus, I love Thee, I know Thou art mine. For Thee, all the follies of sin, I resign. My grace. Just redeem. 
separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, we can also read in 1 Corinthians where the first century church was instructed to take up a collection of the saints on the first day of the week. With that in mind, let us pray. Lord, our God and our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for all that thou hast done for us. Father, we pray that we would take a moment to meditate and reflect upon this past week and how richly we have been blessed and allowed to prosper, Father. Father, we pray that each of us have set aside the first part to give back to thee this morning and give back in a manner not out of necessity, Father, but out of love, out of cheerfulness. Father, so that this, uh, this offering will be acceptable in thy sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. of invitation this morning will be number 557. If you'd like to go ahead and mark that in your hymnal. 557. 557. The song before the lesson will be number 220. 2, 2, 0. See on the chorus there, it said spirited up there. So uh, when we get to the chorus, we're gonna, we're gonna pick it up a little bit, okay? In the first and last verse. Let's sing. I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer, and just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart.
shall be away to see the grandbaby, and so uh, and to go to a ball game. So that's one of the reasons why we'll be gone next weekend. So anyway, we uh, encourage you to be here for uh, support, will, and things that Him has presented to us uh, and to you uh, next week uh, there as well. This morning is uh, we're going to look at a subject that is. Um, say to a certain extent controversial, and the reason I say that is the controversy is over what is modest as far as dress is concerned. Now I want us to take our Bibles this morning as we look together from God's Word, turn to the scripture we had just a few moments ago, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Paul, in writing to the young evangelist Timothy, had just gotten through in the earlier verses of chapter 2, talking about how that uh, men are to pray, uh, basically there, lifting up holy hands uh, there without wrath, wrath and doubting uh, there. And then he continues on, I will therefore, men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting in like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. This idea of modesty and the term modesty as we find here in this particular uh, verse does not necessarily deal with dress. Modesty, as the term is used here, can have to do with one's way of life. Modesty here can have to do with one's language. Modesty here can have to do with one's attitude. And so it's not just one thing that he is talking about here when he talks about the fact that women should be adorn themselves in modest apparel. But it's that which we're going to look at this morning as far as our dress is concerned. It is important that we as Christians speak the right things, say the right things, and say them in such a way that we become Christianity. It is important that we live in such a way that we lead people to Jesus Christ. And so when we talk about modesty and we talk about dress it is very important to understand that we are worshiping the God of heaven, the creator of the universe. We're not just worshiping an idol. We're not just worshiping some being. We are worshiping the creator of the universe. Now, let's be honest with ourselves as we begin our lesson this morning. If God is the creator of the universe, he is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-whatever, then we understand that there's not a human being on the face of the earth that deserves our reverence, our respect, any more than the God of heaven. If he truly is the God of heaven and he truly is all-powerful and he truly did all the things that he did in six 24-hour periods, surely... Surely, of all the people and all the things that exist in the world today, this individual deserves our respect. He deserves our best at whatever it is that we do in worshiping to him or for him. Now, let's qualify this a little more. I want you to take your Bibles with me and to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. When one becomes a Christian, and let me also, I want to make this point as well. When one becomes a Christian, and by Christian I mean is obedient to the gospel, whether it is young or old, one has made a vow to God. Herein lies a great responsibility that falls upon the shoulders of parents, whether we realize it or not, that 
we as parents, when our children become of the age of accountability and desire to be baptized and obey the gospel, then they are responsible for living a Christian life from that point on. See, they can't be your little babies anymore. Although they'll always be your baby till they're 50 or 60. I'm still my mother's baby. That's understandable. But the fact is, now they are a Christian. Now they have to live different. They have to act different. And so that's very important because of the fact that as Christians, God expects us to do certain things. If one is old enough to obey the gospel, if one understands, then one is old enough to be able to do what is required of being a Christian. You know, some people, parents come to me all the time wanting to know, well, is our son ready? How old does one have to be? That is entirely up to a parent. But parents, understand this. If a child is old enough to, to want to be baptized and desire to be baptized, you need to explain to them what's going to be required of them as well. Because as a parent, they have to teach their children what to do as a Christian. We train them. And we have to bring them up that way. And we want our children at a young age to obey the gospel. The heart is tender. Why not? Of course. But at the same time, there falls a great responsibility on a parent who has a young child who's been obedient to the gospel to train that child in the direction that he or she should go because if you don't, when they get older, they will fall away if you're not very careful. So we want to train our children the way they should should go. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 14 through 18 the apostle Paul writes be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship hath righteous unrighteous and what communion hath light with darkness and what accord with Christ uh, hath Christ with Belial or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols for ye are the temple of the living God as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their gods, and they shall be my people. Now, here's a point that we, fail to, we seldom fail to realize. As Christians, we are the temple of the living God. Our bodies are a temple unto God as such. I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them. Be ye separate, saith the Lord, touch not the unclean thing. We as Christians are to be separate from the world. There's our point. We're not, we are to be separated, separate from the world. Therefore, that means that I can't act like everybody else in the world. There must be a distinguishing marks, mark or marks, in my life that shows the difference between me and the rest of the world because if there's nothing to show the difference, then why in the world would anybody want to be a Christian? I mean, after all, I, they, don't, they don't do any different than anybody else in the world, so why in the, what's so important about being a Christian? And there's the difference. There's the point we're trying to make. We, we have to be different. Not the fact that we want to be so different that people can't help but see <laughs> we want Christ to be seen in us sometimes are we ashamed of Christ are we ashamed to be called a Christian are we ashamed of our people to know that we are a Christian we shouldn't be we are to be different from the world we're not to be like the world anybody can be like the world not everyone can be a Christian not everyone can be a Christian because they don't choose to be. They can be. God died for all of the lost. God wishes that every man would be saved, but not all men choose to be saved. Not all men choose to be a Christian. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Ye are not your own. 
You see, it's important that we understand that we now belong to God as a Christian. When we become obedient to the gospel of Christ, we now belong to God. God is, He is our Lord. He is our Master. He is our ruler. He is the one that dictates how we live in life. And the kind of life that we should live for each other and for Him. So we are not our own, but the Lord's. Number three, we are to be a living sacrifice to God. Turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, who are we presenting our bodies to? To the world? No. We're presenting our bodies to the, to the Lord. <laughs> our bodies are to be a living sacrifice toward God. There are a lot of people in the world today, and you know and I know, when it comes to modesty, it's, it, they're far cry from even knowing what the word even means. There are a lot of in, immodest people in the world in which we live, per se. They're not presenting their bodies as a living sacrifice, but we as Christians are commanded to present our bodies as a living sacrifice <laughs> unto God. Ye are not your own. The body which you have is not yours, it's the Lord's. It's the Lord's first. But let me also say, if you're married, it's your husband's or your spouse's second. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 7. The wife doesn't own her body, her husband does. The husband doesn't own his body, the wife does. God owns it first, your spouse owns it second if you're married. And who in the world are we trying to impress in the world in which we live? Why do we dress the way we do? And when I talk about modesty, I'm not talking about just women. Men the same way. Men can be just as immodest as a woman can be immodest. I mean, after all, the world in which we live, you have it both ways. Boys and girls, men and women, immodest in the things that they do in life. Notice, fourth of all, we're to be not, excuse me, we're not to be conformed to the world. Look at verse 2 of Romans chapter 12. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So I'm not to be conformed to this world, but I'm to be transformed. The sad thing about it is, in a lot of cases, it's the opposite. It's the opposite. We're not transformed. The world has transformed us. Rather than Christians transforming the world, the world transforms Christians because we as Christians think we have to be like everybody else in the world. No, you don't. You shouldn't be. You won't be if you live the Christian life. You'll be different from the rest of the world. That's what God demands. He demands purity. He demands holiness. He wants us to be holy. He wants us to be perfect. Not that we're going to be sinless, but we can be perfect as a declared state by God if we're willing to repent, if we're willing to turn from the error of our way, if we're willing to give up the world. And there's the problem we have, giving up the world, because that's what causes us to do what we do today, I'm afraid. Fifth of all, we are to be transformed and prove that which is good. We're to do what, Paul? Prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Each and every one of us, young and old, and see, this, if you want to know about your children, are they old enough to understand what's required of them? Because 
as a Christian, they must obey God's commands in every respect. Sixth of all, we're to bring up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Our children are important to us. We love them dearly. Each and every one of us love our children. Even when they get to be old, we still love our children, per se. When our children are young, they have to be trained. They have to be taught. We send them to school so they can get an education. Why do we do that? So that they can be able to get along in the world in which we live. Education is an important part of that. Children need to have an education. They need to be able to add, subtract. They need to be able to read. We have so many children today graduating high school that can't read. How sad it is that we can't read in the world in which we live today. You know, our children, we want our children to be smart. We want them to go to college. We want them to get a degree. Why? Because we want them to do well in life. We're willing to spend thousands of dollars. A college education is expensive in the world in which we live and getting more expensive day by day. But here's the question. What about their spiritual education? You say, you sure are going around the world to get to it. I am going around the world to get where I want to go this morning. Because all this is involved, I believe, in understanding what God requires of us when it comes to modesty. Seventh of all, modesty is expected by God in all things. We don't have a choice in this matter. God expects that if I'm a Christian, then I act accordingly. And modesty is involved in that. What did Paul tell the uh, Timothy there in verse 9 in like manner also women adorn themselves in modest apparel modest apparel now the question many times comes up what is modest what is immodest and I generally think most people know what's modest and what's immodest we know as Christians how we should dress and how we should not dress let me say this in the world in which we live today, there's too much thigh and too much cleavage that's being shown, even by members of the Lord's church. And it's not right. That's not modesty. It is amazing to me how many young girls go to a doctor to have different things done to their bodies. And my question is, why? Why is that so important if you're not going to show it off? I understand why some may have some things done. There are a number of things, reasons that could be true. But I also know there are a number of reasons why they're doing it that is not what a Christian ought to be doing. Because they're doing it so they can show it off. Or else why would they be doing it? Now, you can apply that where you want to apply it. I mean, it, that may be true in a lot of cases. It may not be true in some cases. I acknowledge that. But I do know that a lot are doing it so they can show it off. That's the only reason they're doing it. See, look at, look at me. Look how big I am. And this, that, and the other. Well, that's immodesty. We're doing the wrong thing for the wrong reason. Modesty here, as far as the Bible is concerned, yes, it has to do with dress, but it also has to do with character. Character is important as far as modesty is concerned. Should a young boy or a young girl wear shorts? A lot of people say, well, I don't have a problem with boys wearing shorts. Well, how long did they need to be? We send our children to Maywood Christian Camp. And I notice Maywood Christian Camp, and they're required to wear shorts to the knee. It should not be any different in church services, brethren. 
church services are more important than Maywood Christian Camp is. As much as I love Maywood Christian Camp and as much as we support as a congregation, the Lord's church comes first. And when it comes to worshiping the God of heaven, we need to think about what we're doing. And it's not just Sunday morning, it's Sunday night and Wednesday night. We're all here to worship God. And we need to think about how we dress. Because a lot of times I don't think we think about how we dress. We're in the presence of the God of heaven. I know you don't see him. He's here, though. Our attitude means everything as far as worship is concerned. Our attitude toward the way we dress means everything as to how we worship God, acceptably or not whether we realize that or not. The fact is, God requires us to be holy. God didn't just allow the priests to come before Him in any old garb they wanted to. He required them to have a certain vest put upon it and certain garments that they had to wear. And God requires the same of us, even as Christians today. He wants us to be modest in our dress. And we're talking about young and old. Young people need to dress modestly. Older people need to dress modestly. Some of us need to wake up and see who we're trying to impress. Because the fact of the matter is, it's God who is, we should be concerned about. <coughs> Modesty is expected by God in all things. Not just in dress, but also in the way that we talk the way that we speak. It is addressed also in the way of our attitude. We can be very modest with our attitude. We can be very modest with the way we speak to one another or speak in general as far as... Wait, wait a minute, preacher, you're talking about you know, saying things that are not kind, saying things that are vulgar and so forth. Yes, I am. It's exactly what we're talking about. Modesty is involved in that. It's all involved in this idea of modesty. So what should we wear? Can we wear short skirts? Can we wear long skirts? Should we, what should we wear? That which is modest. If you're trying to get the attention of someone else or somebody, then you're doing it for the wrong reason. It's immodest. It's immodest. Paul makes reference to the fact here in this particular passage of, of them braiding their hair and putting gold and silver in their hair. This was a way back in the time in which Paul was writing that women would uh, try to uh, put certain things on that would draw the attention to them. And that's just the opposite of what modesty does. Modesty does not draw the attention. Modesty does not want the attention. And so we as individuals, men and women, men and women, Boys and girls need to understand that, you know, it's, we're not trying to draw attention. If a young lady is putting on her face and wearing the short skirt because she's got the eye of a young man, she's not going to get what she wants, what she should want in life. If that's what it takes to get him or her by the way you dress, then you don't need it. I realize we live in a world today, I mean, you, are you, you can't even subscribe to a magazine, you can't subscribe to cable, you can't subscribe to a lot of things in life, basically based upon the fact that most of it's immodest. You have people that dress any which way but the right way. Is, <laughs> is there such thing as a scriptural bathing suit? I don't know the answer to that question. I would probably say there are not very many out there that is scriptural, if we stop and think about it. I mean, after all, how much leg can you show? And be right in the sight of God. What is God going to approve of? Is it the fact that a dress has to be all the way down to the ankle? Well, I mean, you know... <laughs> Back in the 1800s, that's all they wore was ankle-length brisses and stuff. And, hey, you can still be immodest in those. Because a lot of them, most of the time, had the cleavage showing. And so that was immodest. Even though the dress was long enough, the cleavage was showing. So, you know, it's not about all about one thing. It's all about the whole thing. And when we 
do those things. And I say this about men because men run around all the time without a shirt on. I see young boys running, and I realize it's hot outside, but, you know, also there are girls and there are women that get turned on by the physique of a young man running with nothing but a pair of shorts on. We get disturbed by that sometimes. Ladies do. Men get men are drawn by sight, ladies. And I I shouldn't have to say that because I think you pretty much know that. They're excited by what they see. And so therefore we we don't need to be laying it bare so that they can see everything we have. No husband wants his wife to be as the world. Maybe art in a bedroom. It's not all right in life. Christian modesty, young and old, needs to be focused in the right direction. Now, brethren, I want us to to realize in an article written by Richard Mansell, he makes the following points. He says, The world's standards of modesty and fashion in Western culture are degenerating at alarming rate. Even in worship, immodesty is everywhere. Some men won't serve the Lord's Supper because of the cleavage and thighs that are on display. Is bearing our body doing worship respectful of God? Knowing men are visually stimulated, why would sisters in Christ flaunt their bodies? Do they want men to lust after them? If so, why? A Christian woman wears barely any clothes and uses the excuse that men aren't supposed to be lusting anyway. This is a pathetic excuse. Women are not supposed to be provoking men to lust either. What he does with his eyes and her responsibility to be modest are two separate issues. Christian men must realize that women are also stimulated by men's bodies. They can be caused to lust also. Christian men should not be seen without their shirts on or wearing tight, revealing clothing. You see, modesty is not just for women. Modesty is for men as well. We need to think seriously about what we do as a Christian. It, it reflects upon us. Not only upon us, it reflects upon the church. It reflects upon the Christ. It reflects upon God. Because when God tells us that we are not our own, see, when you make that vow to become a Christian, you're no longer the ruler of your body, the ruler of your mind, God is. Because you made that vow to give your life to Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of people don't understand that. And I know in the, in the denominational world, that phrase is used a lot. Give your life to Jesus Christ. And that's a good phrase because basically that's what you're doing. The only problem with it is they, they just have you praying it in, not doing what God would have you to do as far as obedience to the gospel is concerned. But it is a good thing because that's exactly what's happening. You're giving your life to Jesus Christ. Now the question this morning is, are you doing what God would have you to do when it comes to modesty? In all things, we are to be modest toward God. Clothing is one of those things, the way we dress. Our young children, I don't care if they're 9 or 10, 7 or 8, 5 or 6. Of course, we're not going to have a 5 and 6-year-olds that obey the gospel, but immaterial as far as age is concerned, when they obey the gospel, they become a Christian, they are expected to begin dressing as a Christian. And we who are older need to give the proper example for our younger children, adults, ladies, to follow after as well. So I hope you will think about this. It's done with love. We need to think about what, how we dress, the way we parade ourselves around, because it does reflect upon our Christianity. If you're here this morning, you're not a member of the Lord's Church. You can become one. Hear the Word. Believe it. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess the good name publicly. And be baptized for the remission of your sins. If you're
you're here, member of the Lord's church, and you've gone astray, you need to come back and make things right with God, then we encourage you to do that as well. As together we stand and sing.